I'm always amazed by all the talent and gifts that, that uh, sit around this room and hear, hearing about service projects and such. Uh, obviously, the success of this class is not going to be when all the chairs are full. It's going to be when all the chairs are empty. When we're all out uh, involved in other ministries within the church, when we're all out involved in other things on, on Sunday morning. Uh, teaching always has its role. Uh, we're going to talk about that a lot this morning in terms of uh, equipping of the saints, uh, you know, ensuring that uh, the, the life we're living, the obedience that we ascribe to, the, uh, the love that we're showing is all grounded in uh, fundamental truths of Scripture. But uh, you know, we're, we're going to start with just a quick recap, as we always do. Does, does anyone remember the three tests that we've talked about? Well, what, let's start with what's, primary, what's the primary goal that John's writing to in 1 John? Just one assurance of salvation, right? So that, that's where it all starts. And he tells us that uh, in, in 1 John 5, which we'll study here in a few weeks. But it's all about assurance of salvation. So he's writing to the church. He wants to make sure that people in the church understand what false doctrine, what heretics look like, what, what, uh, what unbelief looks like. He wants to ensure the purity of the faith, that at the end of the day, Christ matters. And who Christ is matters. Christ is not up for our determination. Uh, it's not all about some Jesus that we've invented in our own imagination. It's about the Jesus who's been defined in Scripture and the Jesus that's, uh, that's come to rescue us from, from sin. Uh, what are the three tests that he tells us we can, uh, you know, we can know that we're saved by? Moral test. Moral test, yep. Social test. Social test. Uh, in the, in, the, in, in the doctrinal test, yeah. And those, th those three things manifest themselves in obedience or, or, or what John calls righteousness. We studied that in 1 John 2. Uh, in love, which we studied immediately thereafter, and then uh, ultimately in, uh, in, in truth, right? That the three always have to go together. And when all, th all three of those are right in life, you have that assurance of salvation. And when, when they're off, you don't. And again, you don't lose your salvation. You can't lose your salvation. Salvation doesn't belong to us. It belongs to Christ, right? It's a gift of God. And when he gives a gift, he doesn't take it back based on actions of our part. And that's a lesson for another, another week. Uh, taking those three tests, he then goes into three contrasts in which he's going to make sure that those tests are pounded home to us. He's going to make sure that we really understand what he's saying. And he's going to show us what good looks like and what bad looks like. And over the past two weeks, we've gone through the, the, uh, the, the contrast of righteousness versus sin. We've gone through love and hate. And next week, we're going to go through truth and error. But just like John did when he was teaching the tests themselves, he's going to stop for a brief, a brief period here in, in, in Scripture. Uh, this is going to be 1 John 3, 19 through 24. And he's going to stop and again, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but it's as if he knows these teachings are really, really hard. Right? Because everyone's going to look at it and, and think, am, am I obedient? You know, where I'm not obedient, does that mean I'm not a, not a Christian? And so John is going to stop right here again and again remind his audience, you are the saved. You, you are the believers. I'm teaching these things so that you may know and so that you'll be able to identify false uh, prophecy within the, uh, within the church. So, you know, I'm going to do something a little bit different this morning. I wanted to read some opening thoughts that I had regarding uh, assurance, uh, because this is not a doctrine, as you know, that's taught in a lot of churches these days. Uh, very few churches have taught, teach James or teach 1st, 2nd, 3rd John anymore, it seems. Uh, Greg just taught it, by the way. He taught it in uh, 2019, just prior to, prior to COVID. Uh, and the reason I think that a lot of, a lot of churches don't teach First John, don't teach that doctrine of assurance. Why we don't take that doctrine of assurance overly seriously is that, is that preaching to a large part has been very shallow across especially the Western world. Uh, the presentation of the gospel has been superficial and trivial at best. You know, depending on which church you're watching or attending on, on uh, in any weekend, you, you may hear a lot of different versions of the truth in which there's only one. But a lot of churches will leave out sin as an example and, and repentance on the other side. And so that's crept into the church in a big way. Uh, the church is in an age of tolerance and acceptance, right? Okay, if you wanna believe something different, that's up to you, come in, validate us with your presence. Uh, we'll, we'll give you a, a sermon that helps you feel good about yourself, right? All these things happen week in and week out. Um, most, most 
Churches no longer teach the doctrine of original sin, that fundamentally we're not sinners. But fundamentally, we all have good inside us. It's, that good's just waiting to be brought out. So we need to give a positive, motivating sermon that, that allows us to go out and do and take advantage of the fact that that goodness is inside and pull it out. Right? And so you see that a lot. Uh, and, and then last, uh, many attendees never considered faith beyond just a simple transaction that occurred with Christ years ago. And yet you're not going to see anything in Scripture about a prayer you pray or an event that occurs or something that transpires in life one time that is assuring of anything in salvation, right? And, and many of us have attended churches in which we've been assured of our salvation because of a prayer we prayed, or because something we said, or because of the way, you know, you, you, you name it. But faith is significantly deeper than that. Uh, there's a reason that John wrote this, uh, this epistle. You know, if we understood faith correctly, as Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 define it, right? It's a gift of God. If we understood what believe means, more than just a, a statement that we make at one point in our life, if we understood those things, John three sixteen, there, by the way, John three thirty six, and and many others, if, if we did, we'd understand uh, and be a lot more concerned about this topic of assurance. Because when you understand how, you know, what faith is and what it requires of us, it is a free gift of God, but when you understand the new life to which we're called, assurance becomes more important because none of us can live up to God's holy standard. And yet it's not until, we, until we've accepted Christ and, and truly have faith that ultimately Christ begins living in us in which we can begin bearing fruit, right? So this is not about works. Works come after faith. But faith is a whole lot more than just a statement you make or something that occurs in your life one time. Faith is a way of life. So John's audience is at a point in which, as is, is most of the commentators point out, they're beaten down a little bit because John's teaching some hard truths. When he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. I don't know about you guys, but I, there's not a day goes by that I don't break at least one commandment that I know of and probably dozens that, that I'm not even aware are, are sin in my life. And so when you think about, if you love me, don't sin anymore, that, that becomes a pretty tough, a pretty tough thing to, to grasp, right? And so there's a reason that John wrote, uh, wrote 1 John. There's a reason that he spent so much time, that we're spending so much time on this doctrine of assurance. It's a really important point when you understand what salvation is and what it's not. So many years after, after John wrote these epistles, uh, there, there, became, uh, there, there came a guy to the U.S., a guy by the name of Jonathan Edwards, who, who participated and was, was a leader in what, what we've come to know as the First Great Awakening, right? And that First Great Awakening was a big revival in which people came to Christ in droves. And it largely, uh, uh, right at the center of that was, was center of that was, was Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Very similar description. There's a lot required of a, of a believer, right? And Jonathan Edwards pointed all that out, hard teachings, Right, and yet, yet with those hard teachings, the country saw a revival, the likes of which it wouldn't see again for quite a while and, and hasn't seen in quite a while at this point. Uh, like the early church, John's audience, uh, people were overwhelmed by the demands of the gospel, the demands that they repent, the demands that they believe, the demands that they obey and submit to Christ. Right, the demands to follow Christ. Not just a transaction in which I go off and do whatever I want, but in Christ I'm a new, what, creation, right? I'm a new creation. And that I've now got the power of the Holy Spirit with me. And the requirement to pursue holiness. It was natural then for them to question the legitimacy of their faith because whether, they, whether their lives uh, were manifesting salvation or not became a really important point especially when you heard Jonathan Edwards speak, especially when you read 1 John. So they also questioned the legitimacy of their faith because the, you know, as to whether the word was in their heart or whether or not they were indwelled with the Holy Spirit. And specifically uh, for the saints, the believers, the church, if you will, Edwards wrote uh, a follow-up document because he knew that his own teachings were really hard. He didn't want to be confused, and I don't want to be confused this morning, that salvation is somehow by works. It's not. 
But faith is, is a big, big, big concept. Faith is not something you pray one time and walk away and live your life differently because we're promised that we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Right, and so uh, Jonathan Edwards wrote a follow-up work called A Treatise on, uh, on Religious Affection in which he specifically addressed the same concepts that are here in, uh, in 1 John, in which he wanted people to understand that these are requirements of believers, but it all comes by the power of the Holy Spirit living in you. The things that John's talking about here are ways in which we test ourselves and ways in which we understand what God's called us to be, right? Not ways in which we earn our salvation uh, in our, our relationship with him. Does that make sense to everyone? Any, any questions there? <laughs> Say it again, Paul. You know, the simple requirements, and I only mentioned a few here, but uh, repentance, belief or faith, obedience, submission to Christ, uh, following Christ, somewhat the same uh, in pursuing holiness. That, that when we talk about requirements, not requirements of salvation, but requirements, if you will, of, of believers in Christ. And when I say requirements, maybe a better word is not requirements, a better word is more uh, fruit of, of a believer. You know, what, what a believer should notice in their life, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, in Christ your new creation, right? You cannot live your life in a way in which uh, it's unchanged from how you were before Christ came to live within you. It's not possible. There will be long periods of time in the life of believers in which sin occurs. Not, not saying that either, right? We'll never be perfect this side of heaven. But what John's teaching here is specific to what it means to have faith. If you don't understand what faith is and you don't understand obedience, uh, I'm sorry, you don't understand belief, you'll never understand this concept of assurance. Because the reason assurance is so important is faith is significantly more than what a lot of us have been taught and what's been taught a lot since really the Pentecostal movement in the late 1800s. It's no wonder the church is declining in attendance, the, the, the universal church, if you will, in, in the U.S. Right, the churches largely look like the world, or as some have said, the church largely looks like a political movement, in which we're more concerned with who our political leaders are than we are who our leader is. Let me, let me, let me close that before I dive more into the lesson here. Uh, Matthew seven thirteen, Jesus concluding the Sermon on the Mount says this, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Okay, those who find it are few. He also says in the Sermon on the Mount, many will come to me on that day, the day of judgment, and say, Lord, Lord, and I'll say, get thee away from me, I never knew you. Acknowledging that there are people that call on his name that don't have faith, that don't have faith, that never had faith. You know, some of which were perhaps falsely assured of, of some form of salvation that wasn't legitimate. Some convinced that sin didn't really matter. Right, that sin doesn't separate us, perhaps, from God, uh, especially in this age of tolerance where, where anything goes. I create my own truth. And the church has largely subscribed to that, the universal church, again. Uh, none of the, we're at First Baptist for a reason, I believe this church does teach truth. Uh, so when I talk about the church, it's always the, the, the universal body of believers, university, universal body of people calling themselves believers. Okay, any, any thoughts there? First of all, I just want to affirm you for speaking the truth. Thank you. You don't always hear the truth. You, know, you hear a lot of people telling you what you want to hear, right? Yeah. Sometimes the truth is hard because it sheds the light right, in the darkness. And uh, I agree with you. I think one of the big issues that the church has is a lot of Christians, you know, just like us, are sitting on their hands and they're not getting active from everything going on in our world. And so I think what you're talking about, it's that big word of sanctification, right? It's about to accept Christ and the Holy Spirit and dwells in you. You should be coming, or everybody's goal here should be to be more Christ-like every day, recognizing you're going to take two steps forward sometimes, one step back. It's like I said, we're never going to be sinless, but we should sin less. Absolutely. And so I think your message is a great message to everybody in here. But when we leave here, you got to put it into practice. 
you got to make a difference in this dark world. And we were having a conversation with our daughter yesterday. She has a very good friend who doesn't have the Lord in her life. And as my daughter was trying to help her, it became an adversarial kind of conversation. And, and my message to her, and Deb's message to her was, that's what discipleship is all about. It's a dirty business. Yeah. And when you're trying to teach somebody and show them the light, you're living in the darkness. That darkness is going to hate the light. That's why if you're really walking your walk, you're going to lose friends, you're going to lose family members, and you're going to be ostracized. That's what it says in the Word of God. And so anyways, I think it's awesome to hear. Tell me you no, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, all extraordinarily well said. Uh, the additional color that I would add there is the ability to do the will of God is the gift of God. And the obedience in our life is a result of, of the one that we know to be true. Right? It's a gift from him. Our obedience always flows from him. You can't be obedient apart from Christ because the very first and greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right, so you cannot be obedient to Christ without the filling of the Spirit, without, without genuinely being saved. John's just simply calling our attention to, here's how you know. If you're walking right. with the Lord, you're going to be different than the world. If you're walking with the Lord, your life should be different than the world. If, if, if the only man who ever lived a perfect life, if his life ended up in being hung on a cross, why would we think that our lives would be any different if we lived a perfect life? Right, and, and I always say perhaps the reason my life doesn't have more persecution is that my life still doesn't look enough like Jesus. It, it never will look entirely like Jesus, this side of heaven, right? That's not, not what we're saying. But it is a continual pro process, and we make continual progress by the power of the Holy Spirit and through him working in us. Yeah, but I do, I do highly encourage you to, uh, to read uh, Jonathan Edwards' uh, Centers in the Hands of an Angry God and then turn around and read right behind it. Um, uh, the, second doc, uh, the second document he wrote, uh, Treatise on Religious Affection, which basically teaches First John all over again. Right? We can, we can have joy. I, I'm not saying these things. I'm teaching so that we may know. I'm not saying these things as a threat to anyone, but saying these things in such a way in which we can embrace the joy that comes along with assurance. Right? Assurance is a tremendous gift, and most of us never study it. Most of us never hear it taught from the pulpit. And most of us really never grasp the great gift that God's given us in assurance. And we're going to talk more this morning around why assurance is important. Anyone want to, anyone want to take a stab at why it's important for us to know? You know why, why is it God wants us to know? Why is it he doesn't want us guessing? We can Every, live in confidence and peace. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big one, right? Just being able to live in confidence and, and, and peace, knowing to whom we belong, right? I think it impacts everything. It's when you can live in confidence and in peace, assured of your salvation, then things like COVID don't create, yeah. you know, debilitating fear. And things like that, I mean, it just enables you to move through life knowing that our lives are eternal and will be again. That's another one, right? Uh, just staying the course in good times and bad, knowing knowing that it's all being orchestrated for for our good and his eternal purpose. Hey, Robert. Yeah. You know, I never say anything. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Seven years ago, I almost died. I went into a, I was on a bed for eight and a half days. And um, going out, the doctors told me I wasn't going to make it. Uh, but um, the peace I had was unbelievable. I, I, I don't, I can't tell you what it felt like, but I just, it, I had no fear. They said, "Tell your wife whatever you want to tell her, because um, you're not going to make it." And uh, um, I'm worried about my kids, but I knew they were safe and. It'd be okay. I mean, it'd be okay. And next thing I know, I wake up eight, half day, eight days later with two coming out of my mouth. But that point for me was huge. Because you just, the fear you think you're going to have just wasn't there. Yeah. 
just had it head on. And I, I had, it was so calm. How did it change your life after that? Like, like, how did your life quit my job? Two weeks after I got out of the hospital. Um, material things are irrelevant. I want to help people as much as I can help them. I want to live for us. And the families keep them open. So they, they change it. I was going this path. Tell me. I just said, no more. Yeah. That's awesome. And that assurance is unbelievable. That's such, such a great witness, Clark. Appreciate you sharing that. How would you like to have faced that situation without the confidence of knowing where you would wake up had, had it gone the other way? Right? And yet people do it. People do it every day. And we're going we're gonna to study that a little bit too this morning or next week, whenever, whenever we get there. Um, <laughs> but just that uh, um, yeah, yeah, one thing we'll talk about is the way in which we suppress truth. You know, Romans 1, 16, I believe, that men in their unrighteousness suppress the truth. It's not Satan who does it to us, though, though he does tempt us. We follow along with Satan because he's revealing something that's already inside us, not because he's convincing us of something different, right? He puts some, he dangles a shiny object in front of us that get, catches our attention and is something that inside we, we want more than we want what God's, what God's offering. It's not to blame him. That's why we'll all give an account at some point ourselves, each of us individually. Right? Satan's not going to pay the price for all sinners. Yeah, he's a bad guy. Yeah, he, yeah he's, he's evil. Yeah, he tempts a lot of people. But he simply reveals what's already in our hearts. Other questions? This is a great, great dialogue, by, by the way. All right, so, so John's teachings have been, uh, been pretty tough so far, as was uh, this conversation this morning. Uh, his teachings, uh, again, were on obedience and sin, love, love and hate, what the two look like. Uh, let, let, me, let me say something about that real quickly here as well. Uh, you know, there are very few litmus tests of, of, of faith. John's going to walk us through that this morning. But when you think of love versus hate, we talked last week, lo love is who? When, he, when, when John's telling us that we'll know by, by our love, and he talked, remember he talked about indifference? That indifference is the same as hate. Right? And that we'll, we, we will know that we're a child of God by our love. Who is he talking about? Loving whom? You guys remember that? Lo loving one another, but who's one another? The body of Christ, the body of Christ right? How can you be assured of salvation if you're not a member of a church, if you're not involved in a church? Just a rhetorical question. I'm not saying you can't be a Christian, but I am asking, I think, a pretty logical question that if he's talking about you'll know you're a believer by the way in which you love the brethren and you're not involved with the brethren, that seems to be a self-indicting question, right? And again, I don't think there's any doctrine out there on church membership. But there is something here that tells us that, if, that one way in which we know we're saved is that we're involved in the local body and we are self-sacrificing to that local body, that we're taking the gifts that we, we've been given and that we're using those for the greater good, that we're dying to self. Okay? So he now wants to reassure us, and he wants us to understand that these are tough teachings, Largely, that they'll never be perfect this side of heaven, but he wants to make sure that we know uh, for reasons that we, we just discussed and for other, other reasons that we'll discuss here shortly. So let me ask you guys, what, stood out, what, what has stood out the most so far in our teachings on, on 1 John? Something that perhaps is new to you, uh, something that perhaps you heard in a different way, something perhaps that's going on in your life that... Uh, you know, that some of these passages were, were an encouragement to, to helping you get through? I think what stood out to me is that it, it's pretty easy in our society, just like you mentioned, to, to go along knowing that you're saved, but the teachings in First John are so very clear that 
if we are saved indeed there will be evidence in our lives in, in a multitude of ways it's going to show and it's really stood out to me and it's helped made me evaluate my own life as well as some of the people I love and know and you know it's really increased my prayer life for, for those people and mm -hmm. I mean it's just we, we can't forget that there should be evidence. I mean, it doesn't, it's like you said, the doings don't, don't get us saved, but if we're saved, you'll yeah. see. Yeah, that's why, Lord, that's why there's so many tests for what a church leader looks like. You read Titus, or you read um, first, first Timothy 5, I believe, for the requirements of church leadership. Um, obedience matters. It, it shows you who's qualified, who's not. Right, and we've largely thrown that out as a, as a church as well, because those standards are too high. Other thoughts? I think um, the direction that our society is going, our, our, our culture is going, is so, such a, massive way in a certain direction that I would say opposes a biblical worldview. And having that biblical worldview that makes you such a minority now that you wonder, am I right? <clears throat> if, if holding to these beliefs is still correct. Yeah. And so it's very reassuring when you read First John that you are still holding to the right set of beliefs. Uh, absolutely, Dan. Uh, really, really well said. I, you think back in history, uh, we, we think things are, I'll call it liberal now or out of control now. But you read back on the ancient Greeks, right? Read, read back on, on the Romans. Uh, this is not new. There's a reason that Paul addresses so hard some of the sins that our culture struggles with today, such as homosexuality. There's a reason that it's in Scripture. It was there and prevalent at the time. It's not, it's not a new phenomenon, right? And yet the church, uh, the church belongs to Christ and the church will survive this too, right? I, you know, in most of our lives, we grew up in a time in which it was easy to be a Christian, right? Because everybody was either was Christian that wasn't Jewish or we didn't even have Muslims in the country largely, right? But if, if you weren't Jewish or, or some other faith, you were a Christian because you were an American, it was easy just to go along with the ride and the tide that says, hey, I'm like everybody else, I'm, I'm a believer. But what's happening now is as we become the minority, now this doctrine of assurance becomes really important, right? Because now a lot of the chaff is getting, getting weeded out, if you will, out, out of the church. And folks who were never believers have left the church. That's just a normal part of history. That's the way in which Christ works in his church. But true believers will persevere to the end. And the church of Christ isn't going anywhere. Right? He is going to accomplish his purpose through us and through, through our, our, our succeeding generations in the same way he has all the way up until now through all sorts of turmoil in history. And that's not the first time the church has been out of control, by the way. You think about wars in the past, crusades, and the way in which the church has set an example for the world that that getting what we want when we want it in this world is more important than anything that we profess to believe in eternity. These things have, had, these things have been there for, for eternity, folks. So let's, uh, let, let's get moving here. Uh, as a pastor, John knows uh, that, his, that his congregation is feeling condemned. And I want to talk quickly about self-condemnation. Uh, guys, I interpret Scripture different than you do through a different lens. You interpret Scripture through a different lens than I do. My, my childhood was not like yours. I grew up a redheaded kid, um, played a little, played some sports, was never the star on the team, um, was an average student. My life looks very different from someone who grew up in Iraq or Africa or a single parent family or, or today a, a family with two, two gay parents, right? My life, my lens is very, very different. And so self-condemnation can occur for a variety of reasons. Here are a few. Some of us are just predisposed to it by all those things I just mentioned, right, by, by the environment in which we grew up in. Some 
of us are more introspective than others. Um, we've all been around people who are overly critical of themselves and others that have absolutely, that are just <laughs> oblivious, right, as to how, how they come across or what, what's actually coming out of, out of their hearts. Um, right, some are, are depressed, some in, in ways in which uh, you know, perhaps it requires drugs to solve, some perhaps is a, a way of self-infliction through uh, uh, you know, just sin in their lives that, that leads to depression. I don't, don't mean to get off on that tangent, uh, so I won't. Um, when we're living our lives in a sinful state, and as believers, that will occur. We're going to see things differently and justify things differently than we see when we're in a healthy state and we're abiding in Christ, right? And then some are affected uh, simply by their circumstances. A guy laid off from his job is going to see things very differently than the guy that just got a massive paycheck from a business they sold or from a promotion they received or whatever those things are in life that separate us. We, we all have to see things differently. And if we're honest with ourselves, that self-condemnation can occur. And so the first thing John is going to uh, identify, first he's going to acknowledge it's real, but he's going to identify in us uh, exactly what that looks like and how, how we overcome that. And so uh, how is a believer to deal with such, uh, such doubt? Anyone have any thoughts? Would it surprise you if I told you the burden's on you, not on Christ? That John's going to put it on us to deal with that doubt. Now we perform in this work, we transform by the mind. Yeah. That's the end of work. Yeah. Right? I, the thing is, if, if we can do it, that's it's the I, simplest things of life are hearts. Yeah. And it's something that, you know, we know by the end of work, we all live our lives. I would, I would, I would be thankful for the last few. Days, weeks, months. Yeah, that's that's so well said, David. I think it it also it hinges on a proper understanding of your identity in Christ. Yeah. You know, uh, if you understand uh, what what that is, that we have direct we have direct access to God for relationship with Christ. Absolutely. Then, that pours over into reading scripture in that perspective. Absolutely. I'll take it, I'll take it a, 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 even another direction of, um, you know, I think everyone understands the, uh, the doctrine of election and the debate that happens there between Calvinists and Arminians. I won't get into that a lot this morning, but if you're a Calvinist and believe that salvation belongs to God, you believe you can never lose it because it belongs to God. If you're an Arminian and you believe in the concept of free will and that salvation belongs to you as an individual, if you're a consistent Arminian, you believe you can lose it. Right? And then there's a hodgepodge of folks, folks in between as well. So depending on where you stand on a lot of these things, it, it changes the way in which you see Christ, the way in which you can grow confident in your, in your assurance. I also was thinking about the person that Paul wrote the Corinthians that said, take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Yeah. We struggle with doubt. And I think really when you look at a lot of doubt, sometimes it's a sort of a under a microscope. It's really selfishness, not unlike pride, you know. Um, just we can confess it. Yeah, that's 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 so so well said. You take every thought captive, you have to stop it in its tracks, get it out of its head, but then you have to replace it with the truth. Yeah. And, it, you know, that's the key is doing both, taking it captive and then replacing it with the truth. Yeah, so there's an extra mic up here. You guys need to finish this uh, this lesson uh, because that, that's, I mean, you know, it is, as Jonathan said, simple. Right? It's very clearly laid out for us in Scripture, but... Sin gets in the way. Right? But that's how you know. And I think it's in Romans 8 that goes back and just simply states there's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ. Yeah, yeah. We're going to talk about that one too. Yeah, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Neither death nor life nor angels. Right? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Yep, we're gonna hit. We're gonna hit. We're gonna hit all those things uh, next week. <laughs> and I'm gonna. 
I'm going to finish up here uh, the next four minutes uh, just just talking through uh, just a, a, an initial introduction to a couple of these verses here. So our response to doubt is always to remember what we know to be true. What, what's the opposite of doubt? Dan, I think I heard you say it, faith, right? The opposite of doubt is faith. What's the op- what, uh, what is faith based upon? What is faith always based upon? Grace. Grace, but where, where, do we, where do we learn about grace? How do we learn about Jesus? The word, word of God, right? I mean, it's through the, through the truth that God's left for us. And so it's not surprising that John's going to take us back to these places. He's going to remind us what we know to be true, right? And just keep us focused. And as Jonathan said, if you're not in the word, it's hard to do that, right? Because doubt, disillusion, right? Uncertainty creep in day in and day out for a variety of different reasons. So John, uh, interestingly enough, uses the word here as he starts this passage, reassure, because you remember after he taught the te- when he taught the tests uh, and, he, and he taught about obedience and love, he stopped to assurance uh, to assure us there before he, he dove into uh, to truth. And here he is again doing the same thing. And so now he's going to reassure us and it's still in still in our hearts, the confidence as to who we are. So ultimately, every person is born with the law of God written on their hearts. And with a conscience to convict or acquit them. Is that a true statement? We're all image bearers. We're all image bearers, absolutely. Every person is born with the law of God written on their hearts and with a conscience to convict or acquit them. Every person, no matter where you are in the world, no matter the family you grew up in, as I kind of described earlier, no matter the experience you had in school, whether you were the star quarterback or the bully or the math expert, whatever, whatever, whatever you were, is that a true statement? Yeah, you know how we know that? Because Romans 2.14 says, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They weren't given the law the way the Jews were. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. That's not some of us. That's all of us. That's not believers. That's all of us. Not limited to believers. That's all of us. As believers, the word informs us. Um, First Peter tells us that we're born again, right? We have a new life. We're being sanctified, right? I think as several, several of you talked earlier, Greg, I know you mentioned this, uh, just that, that, that the progress we make day in and day out by the power of the Holy Spirit and being conformed to Christ. Uh, we're to know and obey the word. Yeah, we talked about that in 1 John, but Paul also addresses it in, 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 in 2 Corinthians. And we're to be assured by our consciences. Our conscience is God's guilt-producing warning device for our souls. Have you ever thought about that? That The conscience is there for a reason. And it's there to trigger a thought inside us that says, what I'm doing is not what I should be doing. And it's very similar to, to the way in which pain is a warning sign for our physical bodies. If you think about something like leprosy, leprosy is a loss of, of, uh, of feeling, the loss of nerves, if you will. A leper can, can uh, melt skin by getting too close to fire that they can't feel the heat. And in the same way, a sinner can ultimately become callous to sin, where you're not feeling that sin in our lives. So it's always critical that our consciences are continually informed by by. By, by the word of God and ruled by God. Because unfortunately, right, unfortunately, uh, uh, sin can suppress our conscience. Anyone know Romans 118 off the top of their heads? I mentioned this earlier, I think I said 116, but it's 118. That we suppress the, tr- the truth by our own unrighteousness. Right? We suppress the truth. Satan doesn't depress it for, suppress it for us. Christ doesn't suppress it. 
A friend of mine doesn't suppress it for me. I suppress my own truth through my own sin. And so the conscience must always be subordinated to the truth. We always must refine our conscience through the Word of God. And I'm going to leave it there. We'll dive into these passages next week, uh, beginning uh, with, with John, uh, 1 John 3.19. Uh, any, any questions for turnover, Julie? All right, Julie, all, all you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go from having it, not having it, never done it. Um, oh, so convicting makes us want to go out from here and be different and keep growing. So aren't you glad you came today already? A um, couple of things real quickly. For those of you who will be in the 11 o'clock service, Barbara Knudsen's granddaughter is being baptized. Hey. She's going to sit down on the front row with us, with a lot of us that sit down there near the front. So she, she would love for us to stand for her. And her name is Lizzie or Elizabeth, right? Um, and also, we have some new members, Chuck and Suzanne Petit. So we're, we're so excited. We've known them forever and a day. Um, and also, Tom and Kathleen Sims. So we're so thrilled to have you guys. So um, it's been a great day. Let's go out and make a difference and be different. Paula, can you pray for us as we leave? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's good. Yeah, yeah, that's. Right. 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 Right.